before Jesus, your dear son, and for this time to be in your word. We ask you, Lord, this day that we might see how you as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit work to keep us in faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, well today we start chapter 3 of uh, 1 John. And the focus is really on being children of God and sin. Uh, let me read the first portion and then we'll jump into it. See what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, we are the children of God now. But what we will be has not yet been made manifest. We know that when he is made manifest, we will be like him. Because we'll see him just as he is. All right, let's just start with those that that portion there. Uh, no. Okay. What the apostles were given to see, which there and with their and our unaided eyes alone are actually unable to see. God played deeply, not with an unaided eye, but with the mind and the heart and with the Spirit's guidance, what it means to, in concrete terms, for the faithful to be the, the beloved of God. What a thought. You know, God loves us so much and we're in constant rebellion with him because we fall into sin on a con continuous basis. And yet, um, you know, he sent his son Jesus to die for us and he gave his Holy Spirit to us so that our sins are removed from his sight that uh, we continue to be his because of Christ. It all depends on Christ. If this uh, Holy Spirit that we have been given continues to work to call us back, but we continuously sin. Uh, it's the frailty of our human nature. I'm talking about our sinful nature now. I'm not talking about as we were originally created. It's just the frailty that we will fight all the way to the end. And it is necessary for us to fight and not accept sin as just, uh, you know, well, it's what we do. And accept it. Because once we accept it, then we give permission for it. Instead of that, we need to be confessing it and being re receiving forgiveness. Uh, we are the children of God now. It's not in the by and by, it's right now. But what we will be has not in bid main manifest. That was we don't live as the children of God. If people watch us and see us, they see that we are, in fact, um, sinful beings. We know that when he is made manifest, that is, when we see him, we will be like him. Because we will see him just as he is. 
So his reflection, his, his being will create that change. Now, everyone who has, let's go on with that then on 3.3. Three. Now, everyone who has this hope in him makes himself pure just as that one is pure. That's not work righteousness. Right? That is a, the effect of what's happening with the Holy Spirit working within our heart to want to do God's will. Not to feel like we have to do it, but that we want to do it. That we feel sorry for our sins because we know that offends him. That it cost Christ because of those sins. So if that should always be seen from that perspective and not from the perspective of I'm going to do this right. I want to do it right. Now, everyone who has this hope in him makes himself pure just as that one is. Everyone who lives for the sake of sin lives for the sake of lawlessness. Wow, what a name for today with the stuff that just happened in our historical past. Or hysterical past, however you want to look at it. Um, this... Uh, lawlessness that's what sin is it's rebellion so, um, everyone who lives for the sake of sin lives also for the sake of lawlessness rebellion we've we're in the the camp of the evil one uh, when we're rebelling against god Indeed, sin is lawlessness, and you know that the one who made, who was made manifest so that he might take away sins, that was God's purpose. That's uh, why, why Christ came, to take away sin, and in him there is no sin. Now, two things are happening here. Uh, John's telling us, and reminding us that what Christ did and what he's doing is he's addressing those people who through their philosophy think that they have a higher knowledge and um, that the human activity in sin doesn't mean anything because it's only the spirit that's important. This is the Gnostic or the beginning of Gnosticism which is is really what the philosophy during the Greek period was and what the philosophy of today is. Uh, I don't, you know, I really question where anybody even thinks about beyond this, this time and space uh, that thinks that uh, something will, that when you die, that's it. And who, whose center of, of uh, purpose or thought is their life for them. It's all I-centered. Uh, we call it narcissistic, but uh, um, it's more than that. It's making yourself an idol. Uh, and the point is, when they were talking about Christ and humanity, they said, well, you know, Christ was, a, if he was truly human, then he had sinful body. He, he didn't have uh, perfection. Only in the heavenly realm is there perfection. Six, no one who abides in him lives for the sake of sin. You don't live for the sake of sin, you don't live for yourself. You live to serve others. Um, loving your neighbor as yourself only takes place in that situation. Being concerned about others and giving yourself, and your time, your life, your treasures to help others, that uh, 
that's not narcissistic. That's not living just for yourself. That's loving your neighbor. That's loving your brothers. No one who lives for the sake of sin has either seen him or come to know him. So this idea for the uh, Gnostic, or for the philosophies of the world of of seeing a, a divine revelation of, uh, of of knowing God and knowing Christ without being grounded in Christ uh, and living for righteousness, well, they don't know him, period. They, they uh, have created their own thoughts. Children, let no one deceive you. Now notice how St. John holds together his thought as family, as family relationship. Children doesn't make a difference when uh, what your age is. It's about our relationships. Let no one deceive you. Don't buy into any of this that you that they're trying to teach you now. Uh, any other gospel, the one that was taught you, let that be cursed. The one who lives for the sake of righteousness is righteous. If you live to be righteous, struggle to be righteous, even though you may not be righteous at times because of sin, but struggle to continue to try to be righteous. That comes because of Christ, because of his spirit working within us, just as that one is righteous. Eight, the one who lives for the sake of sin is of the devil. Because the devil has been living for the sake of sin from the beginning. For this reason, the Son of God was made manifest so that he might destroy the works of the devil. So that's why Christ came, to destroy the works of the devil, to recreate or make recreation possible that we as sinful human beings can stand before Almighty God, Holy God, because he's the propitiation for our sins. All right, let me open it up for discussion. What do you think so far? You will have to unmute. You have to unmute to be able to speak. Okay, the define manifest. I know it's, I just mm -hmm. Googled it. It's it's a verb or the, it, it looks like a verb, but I don't, sometimes it doesn't read like one. Okay, it means to make visible, um, to show, to be uh, presented uh, that you can see in your eyes. You can see. So the NIV uh, just says appears. What's uh, that, buddy? I just said the NIV just says appears. He appears. But we, you, we know that when he appears, and then pastors using the study guide made manifest, so it's just the same as when he appears. It, well, it's 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 made like we know it. We know what that is. To be so, made visible, to be able to see. It's there when he shows up for everybody to see. Yeah, we're talking about the the. Uh, the second coming. We're talking about the eschatological end. When he, when he returns, he will be visible. And we'll be like him, because we see him as he is. Now, some and then that's followed. That's followed up with the idea of, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has his hope in him purifies himself, himself, just as he is pure. And, you know, works righteousness aside, there's a lot of discussion in 
Christian circles, different churches, including my tradition, about you know what it, what it, what this purification amounts to uh, in order to be you know in order to be open to the Holy Spirit. Let's let's say, and so I think uh, you know there's there's of course prayer, adherence to the commandments. Yeah, we could go on and on. But I think John's comment here is worth considering. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So that's that's interesting. It's a matter of having the hope. Everyone who has this hope purifies himself. Well, I took history in uh, college, and I always think of the term manifest destiny. Right. You think you've heard of that? Well, well, back, back, yeah, back to these philosophers and the Gnosticism. There's still a lot of this kind of thought that finds its way into mainstream Christianity, you know, outside of philosophy departments. And uh, one would be, you know, when, when you hear talk about God as the first cause or the prime mover, that's Aristotle. And that was an idea held by people like Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. They were deists, you know, aside from, you know, I don't know whatever churches they might have belonged to, but these were views they held that God was a kind of prime mover or first cause. That's Aristotle. And that's different from God as a personal savior. That's that's not the same idea. And then with, with what they call classical Valerian Gnosticism, the first century Gnosticism that John might have been familiar with, what they believed was that there was a God, there was creator God, and then kind of behind the creator God, there was kind of a dark God who had been a kind of primeval God. And uh, so anyway, that, that that's kind of a, a, you know, kind of a mythology that, you know, has gone its way. But you still find people talking about the Old Testament God and the New Testament God, right? I mean, you've heard that. There's the Old Testament God. There's the Old Testament God and the New Testament God. And that's still kind of falling back on that idea that there's kind of a dual God, right? So so these ideas haven't, I don't know if they've entirely been lost. No, they, like, I agree with you. They, <laughs> they haven't primarily been lost. And they, there's a, a lack of understanding of the, uh, of the, the the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are one and the same, and that uh, he hasn't changed. But the God of the Old Testament loved uh, mankind in his creation, and it was why Christ came. Uh, you see him, and you don't see any... If you look at the scriptures, truly, you don't find a change in... in uh, the way in which God deals. His commandments are still the, the way in which his people uh, show their relationship with him. It's a necessary relationship. Uh, that what Christ does is he enables us as human beings to live to the requirements that God laid out that he has because of his holiness between people and the only way to bridge that and maintain God's holiness was Christ that was his solution we had no solution um, one of the things that we see mankind has been able to done is we've learned to somehow cope with that which would if we really considered it and didn't look for escape mechanisms would destroy us. Uh, psychology is, is a mixture of psychology and philosophy and all of that leads to false teaching and it's not the God who is revealed in the Old and New Testament. Okay? Uh, you have to listen to the people on the recording of what's said concerning the people that are the children of God and those who are alien to God. And the problem is that there's an attempt to um, 
take the philosophies of the atheist world and for Christianity or and back at Philo's time and the like uh, that's uh, the uh, Hebrew the Jewish philosopher trying to speak to the atheistic world about his religion and you get that mixture and when you get that mixture you have the different heresies developed that, that try to just destroy the teachings of the church this started out as a discussion on uh the word manifest i looked up two bible verses that have manifest in and it means to show manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed in him it means to show manifest th thy name unto men it means to show thy name unto men okay but now you've you've raised another question what does that mean to manifest his name to show to <laughs> okay but the the name is who he is okay so it is god revealing himself and he does that through his scripture and i've got 20 more verses Okay, go ahead. No, I'm not going to tell you the 20 verses. It's in my concordance. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, the word manifest means to show. Yeah, show. Okay. Or he has been made manifest means he has appeared. Okay, yeah. Right. Visibly see. So you're, that's where you get into the structure of you're using two verbs there made manifest and to me manifest is something that's I, I don't know my definitions from english in college but manifest is uh it sounds like a noun it sounds like something we make that we made that okay, okay it's a verb he appeared. Okay, he showed. It became shown. To make known. Yeah, okay. So. You can't just say, we manifest. You have to throw, you have to use the other verb with it. You have to I, say. I would say yes. Okay. I didn't do very well in English. I had to take dumbbell in English when I got to college. That kind of shocked me. But uh, I didn't think I was that bad in English. But apparently I was. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was a good question. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else on this that we've read so far? Well, Pastor, the last sentence. Well, no one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. But since our, our lives are a constant struggle against sin, how do we answer our, our friends and neighbors who ask, are you a Christian? Okay, let's, let's, let's just go back a second. What verse are you speaking to? Uh, six, six. Nope. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Okay. No one who abides in him lives for the sake of sin. In other words, they don't live, you don't focus to sin, to do that which is evil. Okay? We struggle against that. No one who lives for the sake of sin has either seen him or come to know him. Now, John is really a, approaching those who are trying to put this philosophy of narcissism. Uh, I'm sorry. Na Gnostic. Yeah, Gnostic. Uh, this Gnostic thought that, uh, you know, you have, you have evil body and you have uh, good spirit. And uh, finally, you're released by death, so your spirit uh, 
can do wonderful things and um, enjoy wonderful things. So if that's the case and if the flesh means nothing, then, you know, um, go ahead and sin. I mean, uh, that's uh, God likes to forgive and uh, you like to sin. So do it. No, that's not. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm telling you that's an attitude. That's an attitude of I'm tired of fighting it. So I'm going to enjoy it. That's not the spirit working within your heart. So no one who abides in him, that is anyone who stays with God, lives for the sake of sin, lives to do sin. The commandments mean something. I love God by being able at times to fulfill his will, to be in his presence. Okay. No one who lives for the sake of sin, then that's really the bottom line, for the sake of sin, has either seen him or come to know him. And uh, see, that's what the, the Gnostic was claiming, a higher knowledge and a relationship with the deity. Okay. Does that help? Yes. Yes. Okay. Children, let no one deceive you. The one who lives for the sake of righteousness is righteous. You know, just as that one is righteous, just as Christ is righteous. The one who lives for the sake of sin is of the devil. Now he's given himself up. Because the devil has been living for the sake of sin from the beginning. For the sake of sin, for the sake of lawlessness, for rebellion against God. To destroy all that God created because of his hate for God. For this reason, the Son of God was made manifest. That's why God, Jesus came. So that he might destroy the works of the devil. And the work of the devil is to destroy God's creation. That's why Christ came, to restore. No one who is born of God lives for the sake of sin because he, his seed abides in him. His seed, that's Christ's seed, that's his Holy Spirit, abides in him. Indeed, he is not able to live for the sake of sin because he is born of God. All right. Um, while I was reading this, I'm uh, Robert. I uh, was hearing your explanation at the end again in my mind about the child that's baptized. Do you want to ask that question again? Get on mute. Robert, on mute. My, my question was that uh, when our neighbor asks us, are we a Christian, can we say yes, even though we sin? Yes. Yeah, you just our secular na our neighbors were having a discussion with them. They want, they want to know our world view. Okay. Um, you know, does our, does our struggle against sin disqualifies as a Christian. He might think, well, you're a Christian, but you sin all the time. And that's because we're both simultaneously, see, simultaneously saints and sinners. We are sinful. We have original sin that dwells within us. We do make decisions that are poor. Um, we I don't know how else to say that. The Christian is in a battle between good and evil, if you would, between the devil uh -huh. and, and God. That battle is taking place within us. That battle is to destroy us, all right, on, on the devil's side. On God's side, it is to restore us. 
he sent his son so that his own holiness would not destroy us and that he could make uh, remake the re uh, relationship to bridge if you would the the difference between us to be able for us to be in his presence and to be restored sin had to be paid for it needed an atoning sacrifice you know the, the whole old testament sacrificial system was a type of what was to take place with christ and so it was an atonement and it acted as a substitute until christ died for us life had to be shed the blood had to be shed the life was in the blood um in the atoning sacrifice the sin is forgiven notice it is not approved it's not condoned it's not just passed over it's paid for it's atoned so there's a battle going on uh from in us uh until we die where the sin that we have inherited and the sins that we do because of that at times is constant and his holy spirit works in us so that we battle against this instead of just surrendering so we confess our sins so that we can be forgiven confessing our sins to be forgiven doesn't mean that they weren't already forgiven it means that we release them let go of them god has already forgiven them through christ but we return with each confession of our sins to our baptismal covenant that is the promise the sure inheritance of being connected to christ seeing christ as he is we see him and we will reflect him in how we address our god so it's uh it's still us at the same time we don't lose our identity it's not like um oh hinduism or whatever where you observe uh, uh absorbed into the greater being uh, you are an individual person an individual soul and you are connected to your father i'm talking to your heavenly father now through christ because you've been reborn of water and spirit the battle rages on in you through your whole life all the way to the point of your death the yeah. uh, i see yeah, I, I understand but but the secular person does not grasp that and he sees us as hypocrites okay and what what can you say to that well, i don't know if i can i, I don't know I'm, if i can put in words that he would understand okay i'm 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 sorry that I am not perfect. I know I'm a sinner. That's why I need forgiveness. That's why I need a savior. And if you see that, maybe you are too. Okay. If you're looking yeah. for somebody who is holy, I said, wait till I'm dead. It's that simple. Yeah. You know, I, I know that I'm a sinner. I'm aware of that. I know that I rebel against God all the time. But him in his grace, he has sent me a savior, and I, I hold on to that savior. I trust that savior. And that trust is really stretched hard because I am such a failure. But I'm still trying, and I'm still living not just for myself. And that's the only way I can tell you that I'm a Christian. You see, I can't tell you. I have to show you. I have to live like you belong to God too. Okay? Yeah. 
I hope I can convince him. <laughs> you understand something, and that's something we all should understand. It's not our responsibility to convince them. What we don't want to be is being a stumbling block. So the point that you make when, you know, they, they're pointing their fingers at you and saying, well, you're not much of a Christian. You're right. I'm not much of a Christian, but I am a Christian. I trust in Christ because I know that he's my savior and that he will save me. That I live to try to do what's right. I don't just go live for myself. That's the best I can do. That's what I do. I can't convince you. The Holy Spirit has to convict you. He has to convince you. And it's only done through God's word. So if you don't want to listen to it, that's up to you. See, it's not yours. You don't save a person. Christ does. His spirit does. His word does. Our responsibility is to tell the gospel and to show the gospel. And sometimes we don't do it so well. And all we can do is confess, yeah, you're right. Okay. Well. Uh, three, eight. The one who lives for the sake of sin is the devil. We did that one. Uh, okay. Three nine is where we're at. No one who is born of God lives for the sake of sin because his seed abides in him. Okay, if the Holy Spirit was driven from us, then the seed would not abide in us. That would be the time in which we just quit. Okay. Indeed, he is not able to live for the sake of sin because he is born of God. All right, so you, you know, that's why you struggle because you know that god loves you in this way are the children of god manifest and the children of the devil no one who fails to live for the sake of righteousness is of god nor is the one who fails to love his brother Because this is the message that you heard from the beginning. That we should love one another. All right, so we're back to caring about the other person. About living for the other person. Serving the other person. And then we have the example, not just as Cain, who was of the evil one. And he murdered his brother. Why did he murder him? Because his works were evil, but his brothers were righteous. All right, let's, we've got a couple minutes yet. Let's talk about that one. Uh, Cain and Abel. First, why did Cain kill Abel? You can unmute. Oh, jealousy, resentment, anger at the nature of the the preferred sacrifice. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was a lot of bad blood, bad feeling, resentment, jealousy. What was his resent? Why was the resentment, jealousy? He was jealous of his brother that he was seen to be favored by God. Yeah, or he believed he was taken. Abel's gift was, uh, uh, yeah, Abel's gift, gift was accepted by God. Cain's gift was not. All right, now, it was Cain's problem with God, right? Yes. But in his anger, his personal anger because 
you know, he had not pleased God. God was not pleased with him, but it boiled down to. Um, the reaction was such that, oh, I'll take it out on my brother. That action, that, that action was exactly opposite of what's required, right? That was hate instead of love. Hate that he was accepted in that uh, and uh, Cain was not. Cain was all about Cain. When his offering was not accepted, he was, and God was not pleased with his offering. He didn't know how to react other than that. And so he killed Abel. Now, why would we think that things would be different today uh, as far as the way in which people deal with one another who are Christian or not? In anger, is first of all, is anger a sin? No. No, it's not. It's an emotion. It's what we do with the anger. It's, it's like, like fear. Is that a sin? No. Emotions could trigger our minds and our our physical reactions. Those can be sinful, or they can be acceptable in God's sight. An example would be somebody who um, is driving down the road and uh, all of a sudden is, sees himself coming into an accident and he calls for help. Lord, help me. And God gets him through it. Okay. And his response then is, you know, one of thanksgiving. He, he had fear. What he did, what God has told him to do with that fear. To call upon me on the day of trouble. Somebody's dying of uh, COVID. He's fearful of dying. Now, is it sinful to have that fear of dying? Not really. That's an emotion. That's not something you can control. Uh, I've discussed that uh, with one person who talked about that and said that, uh, you know, it was like drowning. The body fighting for life and feeling the emotions as they're fighting for that life certainly isn't sinful. But calling upon God sees him through that. Okay. Um, so that's the that's right reaction. That's going for uh, that's going to where help is available, where, where fear is conquered by love. Now, love is from God that conquers that fear. It's not you. That's the same thing now, reverse it. If, if we're talking about Cain, we're talking about his reaction from not being accepted, what he is doing, not being accepted. We're not told what he did. All we know is he offered his sacrifice and it was not accepted. We don't have the other portion of that. We know, however, that he saw one who did, and it was his brother, and he hated his brother because of his failure. 
and that hate for his brother drove him to killing his brother, which is, you know, the the all out worst portion of that action. Thou shalt not kill. So, so whatever happened to Cain? Cain was Cain was driven out of the sight of the Lord. Actually, drove himself out of the out of the sight of the Lord. He never confessed his sin. If you go through that very carefully in Genesis, you'll see that he he copes with it rather than confesses it. He and, blame he blames God for the way he fears, the way he feels. Didn't uh, now, buddy? Correct me if I'm wrong here, but when we get to the story of Noah, weren't they talking about the descendants of Cain? Well, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, we know Cain went to dwell on in, on the east of Eden in the land of Nod, wherever that was. And um, that, uh, you know, he had descendants. Um, but, you know, you'd have to go through the genealogy. I'm not, the genealogy of Noah tells you who the survivors were and if they included descendants of Cain. But Cain carried on and, and had children, and, you know, we know that, you know, that's, you know, when Abraham and these people are traveling around, we know that these cities and settlements they came to came from someplace, and some of them must have come from the descendants of Cain. Well, you know, I, I, I hear that, and I'm confused by it, because Noah, uh, he's connected with... Uh, uh, Methuselah. Methuselah. Methuselah dies just before the flood is, uh, takes place. And um, it is Noah, his sons, and his daughters, his son's daughters, or Noah's daughters-in-law and his wife, who are, are saved in the flood. Seven whatever. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to pull out of the memory. It's not coming. Uh, they, but this is just Noah's family is saved from uh, in the flood. So if there are individuals who are connected with uh, Cain, it would be through the daughters. daughters. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, the next thing you hear is about is the Tower of Babel. And in the Tower of Babel, they're trying to make a monument to themselves. And uh, that's when God goes down and confuses the language. And he says they'll, you know, working together like they are, they, they'll be able to do anything. Uh, that's because of the way in which he created man. And you can see that today in the places where we're trying to do things like travel in outer space and uh, so, things that we've developed. So that, that no pun intended, but that uh, Tower of Babel never got off the ground. Correct? <laughs> well, it got a little ways. It and got... I, okay. And it became called the town called or the area called Babylon. Oh, Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's yeah. that's where all that took place. Really? Hmm. So Babylon okay. is really ancient. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. goes way back. Well, yeah. you, you have you have Noah's sons going to different places, but that that's the story we get next. Is that we don't go you know, from there. Then we get to Abraham, and Abraham was really a special guy when you start thinking about it. Um, he became a friend of God. He believed God. He, he was a sinful human being. Uh, you can see that in the story of Abraham. But he was also trying to be righteous. Um, and uh, he trusted God. He believed God. He even, you know, God was, was first. He even would sacrifice Isaac. Uh, he was only son uh, who was to inherit everything and uh, 
because God told him to do that, sacrifice him to me. Uh, and when he does that, then you go to the the uh, the place where he did that was Mount Moriah, which is uh, where Jerusalem is, where the temple, the foundation stone, and all these other things all tie together. Um, and it was at that point that uh, Isaac was to be sacrificed. And then the angel of the Lord, who obviously is also the Lord, which I would, I interpret really to be the pre-incarnate Christ, um, you know, makes his promise. And I'm going to do something very special because you showed that you would not withhold your only son. If you go back and read that, you'll see how uh, important that action of Father Abraham was. That relationship that he had with God. And it's a foundational relationship that we are to have with God. That uh, the commandments tell us that's the foundation. But that doesn't come, until, uh, the commandments don't come until we get to Moses. So, uh, that's that's pretty significant when you think about it. Okay, because his works were evil, but his brothers were righteous, and it's those righteous acts that we are able to do not well but able to do and struggle to do that has given us the uh, the relationship with God because of Christ. We wouldn't struggle without Christ and his Holy Spirit. All right. Well, we're at that time for closing. So let's close with in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon us as we go about this day. May we love our brothers and sisters. May we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. May we live in service to you as we look forward to your return to be what we were meant to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.